Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cisco Optics Podcast, where we talk about pluggable optics for networks. Lasers have been around for over six decades. Since their invention, they have found their way into many applications that have changed our lives. Optical communications is, of course, one of them, and there are many that may surprise you. There's also still plenty of room to take laser performance to new heights, leading to even more new applications. This is episode 37, and we continue our conversation with laser and optics expert Juliet Gopinath, professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. We move on to her project with electrically tunable lenses and their application to 3D brain imaging in mice. Juliet Gopinath is the Alfred T. and Betty E. Look Professor of Electrical, Computer, and Energy Engineering and Physics at the University of Colorado Boulder. She received her BS degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of Minnesota and her MS and PhD degrees at MIT. She was a member of the technical staff at MIT Lincoln Laboratory from 2005 to 2009. Since then, she has led a research group at the University of Colorado Boulder. Her current research interests include ultrafast lasers, nonlinear optics, mid-infrared materials, spectroscopy, orbital angular momentum, and adaptive optical devices. She has published 78 peer-reviewed journal articles and over 97 conference presentations. She is the recipient of an R&D 100 award in 2012 and is an Optica Fellow. She served as an associate editor for the IEEE Photonic Society Journal from 2011 to 2017, the associate director for Qubit in 2019, and is currently an associate editor for Optica. Juliet also teaches a free online course on active optical devices. Just go to Coursera.org and search on active optical devices or search on Juliet Gopinath. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast. On Apple Podcasts, you would click the follow button at the top now. We're part of the Cisco Podcast Network. Check out our blog at blogs.cisco.com and search on hashtag Cisco Optics Blog. All one word, no hyphen, and no spaces. You'll find podcast notes and links there too. For our YouTube playlist, go to youtube.com and search on Cisco Optics. And for product information, go to cisco.com slash go slash optics. And now join me as I talk with Juliet Gopinath. So that's number one out of six. Uh, what would number two be in your mind? Well, why don't I switch over to one of the most applied projects in our lab, and I can tell you about that. We, okay. work, we work on adaptive optical devices, and so we were very interested in being able to make, say, an electrically tunable lens or an electrically tunable prism. When I was starting my group at CU Boulder, I thought, mm -hmm. well, I know a lot about ultrafast and nonlinear optics. That's my bread and butter. But it would be really nice to do something different. And I opened up a magazine and there was there was a discussion as to how you can change the index of refraction and you can look at temperature or strain. And then it pointed out that if you put in and out a liquid, you can get several orders of magnitude improvement. And then somehow I stumbled across this applied physics letters that was talking about a phenomenon called Electro wetting. An electro wetting is a technique, is a phenomenon that was discovered in the 1800s. Sorry, and just to so, be clear, wetting, W E T T, not W E D D. It's electro wetting. Right? Not, not, so, a, not a marriage between electrons. <laughs> no, no, it's electro wetting. Wet, like wetsuit. Yes. Okay. And um, the idea here is that you put a droplet on a hydrophobic surface and then underneath is a conductor. Your droplet needs to be polar, so that means it can conduct electricity. And if you apply a voltage to the bottom and then also to the droplet, you can change the contact angle. And then when you change the contact angle of the liquid to the surface, it turns out that all the other molecules will rearrange themselves to um, provide a perfectly spherical surface. Wait, what and is so, the contact angle? You mean like the, is that related to the shape of the droplet? So if you have a droplet on a surface, there will be an angle at which, um, at which, the, at which the droplet and, and the surface contact. 
And so it is that oh, okay. angle. So like where, okay. Where the curvature of the droplet begins, where it, it, it diverges away from the surface, there's an angle right there. That's right. Oh, okay. That's right. And so if you can modulate that angle, and then all the other molecules in the droplet rearrange themselves to give you to basically modify this spherical shape. Now you have a really nice tunable lens. And it turns wow. out that, remember, I told you there is a hydrophobic layer in between, and that doesn't conduct electricity. So this effect is purely capacitive. You're just moving around the charges in the you know in the conductor and then also in your droplet and so it's really low power now i told you that my lab is in colorado and we are probably entering the driest time of the year so we routinely have humidity between 10 to 20 percent and so we cannot um do research on droplets uh, in my laboratory easily we oh, do have man. some projects and so uh, so there is another way that we can utilize this phenomena, which is essentially to put two density matched liquids in a cylindrical container and, and essentially put some functionalization on the sidewalls. And this allows us to generate tunable lenses and prisms. And so we have used this for microscopy, for building miniature microscopes to understand what's happening with the neurons in the brains of mice. We have used it wow. to make high contrast, um, high rejection optical shutter for the chip scale atomic clock that um, DARPA was quite interested in for many years. And then, then we have also built a non-mechanically steered LIDAR that can steer over 180 degrees at 200 hertz and this last um this last phenomena people got pretty excited about because of the interest in self-driving cars the the lidar application you mean yes okay yeah uh yeah that makes total sense so okay you Help me make the connection between the tunable lens. Tunable lens meaning the focal length is tunable, I assume, right? Yes. So help me make the connection between a tunable lens and all these applications that you mentioned. How does a tunable lens get you to those applications? So let's talk about the brain imaging first. So okay. we have lots of phenomena where where we essentially don't understand what's happening in our brains. We don't understand Parkinson's, we don't understand Alzheimer's, we don't understand PTSD or depression. Many of these uh, diseases we have, we basically don't have effective treatment for. And additionally, you know, I think it's not maybe really well understood the full learning process, or memory or grief, you know, all of these things are associated. And so we are quite interested in making technology that can be used to unlock the secrets of the brain. And mm -hmm. so we work with um, several groups at University of Colorado Anschutz, namely Professor Emily Gibson and Professor Diego Restrepo. And we work um, to make uh, essentially head-mounted microscopes that they can put on um, mice to study the interactions of these neurons. Now, when they do this, they would really like to mic mount this microscope once and develop a 3D image. But with fixed components, that's very hard. The mouse can only handle a few grams. And so if we include a tunable lens, then we can essentially build up a 3D image. So that's the reason there. In terms Sorry, of- the, So you're creating an image of a mouse's brain using, we, using multiple, to get the 3D, do you have like multiple, multiple uh, imaging systems from different directions or what? 
So the dream is to be able to build up a 3D image of the neurons mm. in, in, a, in a mouse's brain and to be able to do this at depth so that one could study uh, a variety of areas that do processing. This is clearly a difficult problem. And of course, one mm. wants to be able to do this completely non-invasively so that one can study like a live, awake, behaving mouse over a period of time. That's, mm -hmm. that's really the dream. And so by using a head-mounted microscope, we can get some of the way there. The microscope has to be miniature. And, and if we include tunable components, then that allows us to scan up and down in depth. And so then mm -hmm. we can build up a 3D stack because you're scanning the focal length, right? Because you're able to tune yes. the focal length with your, your tunable lens. You can scan the different depths by by modulating that focal length. That's correct. Okay. I it's okay, there's sorry, there's one thing I'm still trying to imagine. You mount something <laughs> Sounds kinda cute actually. You mount something on the mouse's head, right? What do you mount? Like you said a microscope, but is it in a uh non-visible wavelength, like a long wavelength that can penetrate the skull? Or do you actually have to, uh, ugh. you don't have to expose their brain, do you? So currently imaging through the skull is quite difficult. So actually the mice undergo a surgery and we put a window with a mount, like with a um, base plate, and then we lock into the base plate with our miniature microscope. Oh, okay. Okay, and then through that window, you can see the the tissue of the brain. Yes. So okay. it turns out that the neurons in the brain do not have a lot of myelination. So myelination are the fibers like around the nerve. And those things are very scattering and they're hard to image through. So mm -hmm. the brain is actually really a perfect place to look. Obviously, the longer the wavelength we use, the further we can go, because mm. the longer wavelengths scatter less. So how deep can you go into the, uh, how deep under the surface of the tissue can you go? So that is a really great question. And I think right now we can go about a couple hundred microns if we use light at 900 nanometers for excitation. People are oh. also exploring longer wavelength, uh, such as 1300 and 1700. Wow, mm -hmm. okay. And are you using any other techniques? Like, uh, remember the um, coherence tomography that was done next door in our, in our grad school labs? So uh, we, we are committed to two forms of technology. That was the third part of my conversation with Juliet Gopinath. Next time, we'll get into multi-photon microscopy. Juliet also teaches a free online course on active optical devices. Just go to Coursera.org and search on active optical devices or search on Juliet Gopinath. Subscribe to this podcast, and we'd really appreciate you helping to get the word out. Share this with friends and colleagues that come to mind when you think of network technology and optics. And leave a review on Apple Podcasts. We're also on all the other major podcast platforms. You may see the Cisco Podcast Network come up when you search for Cisco Optics Podcast. That's where we live, and you can find other great podcasts there, too. Also, check out the Cisco Optics blogs at blogs.cisco.com, and search on hashtag Cisco Optics blog, no spaces, and no hyphens. We also have educational videos on YouTube. Just go to youtube.com and search on Cisco Optics. Thank you for listening. This is Pat Chow, Product Manager at Cisco Optics. The next episode is Part 4 of my conversation with Juliet Gopinath. Until next time. <laughs>